Evan, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ben. Good to see you. So I want to talk to you about a number of different things. But first off, I think one of the challenges when we talk about cancel culture, and I know that your book uh, obviously contains your own chapter dealing with that definition right off the top, is figuring out what is cancel culture and what isn't cancel, cancel culture. Can you give us a couple of examples of, of recent stories that have been in the news that kind of fulfill your own framework that you create in the book for what cancel culture looks like and one that isn't cancel culture from your perspective? Gotcha. Well, um, look, I think the framework that exists in the book, and one of the reasons I thought it was really important to lay out a clear definition of cancel culture is because it's a term that's bandied about in the press all the time. On the, on the left, the left likes to pretend like cancel culture doesn't exist, that it's somehow a figment of our imagination, or there's no such thing as cancel culture. Oftentimes on the right, people are quick to say, oh, it's, it's cancel culture, cancel culture, when it's actually not cancel culture. So from my perspective, in order to defeat it, you first have to define it. And that's why the framework that I lay out, I think, is, is really critical to understanding. And so the way to remember whether something is or isn't cancel culture is through an acronym called CONDEM, C-A-N-D-E-M. And the C is that the crime or the transgression is against the collective. A is that it arises or excel and accelerates very quickly. The N is that the nature of the offense is actually quite small or it's even fabricated. The D is that it produces a disproportionate response. The E, everyone is afraid to defend the person. And then the M is the people who are doing the canceling have this moral absolutism. And so they believe that no matter what they do to that person, in terms of exposing them, harming them, et cetera, it's fully justified because they're on the side of the angels. So I think that that framework is, is useful to look at in terms of looking at, at incidents and instances where people are under fire. One that I think is cancel culture, but also coming at, um, coming at it through the condemned framework is, is what's happened with Bud Light and the, the calls to bud cut, boycott Bud Light. I think that one started out not as an instance of cancel culture, because it was about a, a calls for an economic boycott to force the company to change its, its policy. And the policy in question was whether or not, you know, is Anheuser-Busch endorsing ideology related to, to gender identity and the transgender community, et cetera. And I got no problem, let me be very clear, with, with boycotts. Whether they're emanating from the left or the right, it's always been a legitimate means by which people could take corporations or countries and try to influence their policy through activism. And so the, the, the Bud Light thing, I think, started out as, as just straight um, you know, calls for a boycott. Where it morphed into cancel culture was when you had a lot of folks basically saying, even, even in the instance where Bud Light came out with this if you want to call it an apology, I guess you could. I don't really think it qualifies as an apology. It was an, a feeble attempt at damage control. But it was clear from a lot of the discussions happening online that even if Bud Light had come out and renounced its policy, et cetera, the calls were, let's take a scalp, let's turn them into an example, let's punish them, and then it'll, pull, it'll be a warning shot, a shot across the bow and have a chilling effect on other companies if they go down this road. So that was one where I think it, it wasn't actually cancel culture, but then it morphed into cancel culture based on the framework. Well, so let me uh, dig into that a little bit, because I think that one of the things that bugs me about the way that this term is used is that from my perspective, a, a key element of cancel culture uh, in, and my own understanding, my own definition is that it is holding people to a standard that we might formally have assigned uh, 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 to prominent individuals, celebrities, major corporations, uh, things of that nature, where the standard is uh, is inevitably higher, given that they are, you know, the people who are endorsing a product or you know uh, going out and and you know uh, promoting a movie or something like that, and then applying that standard to just common citizens people who are expressing their views via social media and the like, that you can take, you know, someone who makes a, 
a nasty joke who's a comedian, for example, but then say, well, you know what? They're, they're, they're telling jokes because they're living is telling jokes, you know, right. and then, and then apply that same standard to someone who makes a bad joke on Twitter or on Facebook and then loses their career over it. Uh, in other words, we're, we're taking this standard and then drilling it down to the level of someone who has a thousand followers instead of someone who's selling out Madison square garden and that the standards there, you know, historically in America have always been different, that we expect different things of presidents and politicians and leaders of industry and, you know, major people at the top of brands than we do of just your average American citizen uh, who until recently didn't have the ability for their ideas to go viral and be on the front page of of uh, the now defunct uh, BuzzFeed News, uh, as has obviously right. happened in the past. So, so from my perspective, you know, I look at something like this, and it's hard to adjudicate because, you know, you bring up Dylan Mulvaney. Dylan Mulvaney is someone who has attained a following, has, uh, you know, achieved a level of of social media status. Uh, that allowed them to interview, you know, the president to, you know, be part of these types of influencer promotion things, which we now believe, you know, to have been the the justification for this Bud Light can special. It doesn't even actually look like uh, we we don't know for sure, but it doesn't look like they were actually paid any money, you know, associated with it. it just seemed like a promotional thing. Um, and yet they now take on a new authority and the ability to affect. You know, not just uh, the sales of of beer water, but of <laughs> but of uh, the market cap of major companies uh, in a really meaningful way. So, how do we adjudicate that element of this to sort of say, are we applying a standard to people who, until recently, may or may not have had their thoughts ability, uh, you know, have the capability to drive a million clicks? Yeah. Well, you raise a really good point, which is in the age of the internet. Everybody has the opportunity to share their perspective, to make a bad joke, to make a good joke, to make an observation. And it's this interconnectedness, the news cycle that exists 24 seven, the fact that everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket, therefore can be a, a reporter, um, can weigh in on pretty much any topic of the sun. And what we've done as a consequence of living in this social media world is we've imbued these influencers who have massive followings, in some cases, tens or even hundreds of millions of people who are looking to them for guidance and insight on topics about which they have precisely zero qualification to actually weigh in. And yet they can have a bigger following, a bigger soapbox than even celebrities or brands, et cetera. So you're, you're definitely right there. I would actually argue that not only is it an unfair standard that people who live in the public eye held to one standard and then the average person may be held to, but I would argue that the entire notion of cancel culture is holding everybody, famous and powerless, to a completely impossible standard. And the reason is every single one of us has done or said something dumb or wrong or uncouth at some point in our lives. Every single one of us is fallible and error prone. And the problem with cancel culture is it is a way to dig into someone, to scour their social media from the past, to dig up things that could have even been decades before and try to hold people to this impossible standard where they walk on water and any thing that they've done that's objectionable they receive a severe punishment. And it's not just a punishment for which they have to atone or they have to say, I'm sorry. It is a lifetime sentence of shame and deplatforming. So I actually think part of what's so dangerous about cancel culture is that it removes the ability of people to make mistakes and learn from them. And that's really a detriment to our society writ large. I don't think any of us really wants to live in that world. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to ask you a hard question. I'm, I know that, you know, just given the topic that you've chosen uh, for this book and, and to talk about that you're used to taking hard questions. No, this will be the first one I've ever had. So I'm really excited <laughs> to get one for the first time. Um, Thank you, Ben. The other day, the New York Post had this piece uh, uh, that I saw 
Um, and apparently this is something that, you know, is not necessarily entirely new, but perhaps has new material associated with it, uh, in which uh, the victim of Roman Polanski's uh, child abuse scandal um, from ages ago t is taking a smiling picture with him, having done an interview basically saying that the accusations about uh, the way that he treated her uh, were overblown and that she has forgiven him or something along those lines. Um, this is obviously ancient history, but uh, for those unfamiliar with these accusations, they are extremely serious. They are the worst kind of thing that could be associated with anyone. And yet I'm also someone who loves Roman Polanski's movies. I love Chinatown. I love, uh, you know, some of his more uh, recent work as well. You know, I think he's an incredibly talented director. Uh, you try to associate, you know, you try to have that gap between the art and the artist as we do with Picasso, with so many others who've, uh, you know, had uh, uh, terrible allegations leveled against them. I don't view going after Roman Polanski, much as I love his movies, for an incident of, let's call it what it is, child rape and sex abuse to be something that is cancel culture. You know, it's a criminal act. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's the worst kind of thing. And he obviously had to uh, flee authorities and, and there were a lot of other you know things that came from that. Um, what is your view of the way that we treat actual acts versus the way that we treat comments, jokes, ill thought tweets, you know, uh, uh, social media posts, uh, comments said, you know, without any kind of, of, uh, real thought through them. What's the demarcation there in terms of cancel culture? I thought this was going to be a hard question. That was <laughs> quite easy to answer, man. I'm breathing easy all of a sudden. Um, no, I, I appreciate the question. And I think you in part, answered it yourself, which is there is no comparison between criminal acts and someone making a bad joke on Twitter. And I think part of the problem that we have right now is there is this conflation and a conflation of perceived crimes or you say something that offends me and therefore I decide I'm going to dox you. I'm going to put your address out there. I'm going to lobby against you. I'm going to try to take down your business. I'm going to go when you have a speaking opportunity. I'm going to shout you down based on something you said that I. And what people don't understand, and I, I, I hear people saying, well, cancel culture is really a good thing. And it's important because it holds people accountable and it gives the powerless a way to hold powerful people to account. And I think that's nonsensical. And the reason is, you know, Polanski, um, that's an example where they, these are criminal allegations. You know, I was giving a, a, an interview the other day and, and his actually, I think, qualified as a pretty tough question. I, was, I said I made the assertion that that I didn't think anybody really deserved to be canceled based on the condemned framework. And the guy started screaming at me. What about Harvey Weinstein? What about Harvey Weinstein, Evan? And I said to him, that's not cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Harvey Weinstein is in a prison cell because he was convicted in a court of law. There is due process yeah. in this country. There's a judicial process. He's in prison because he was found guilty by a jury of his peers. They weighed the evidence. He had a fair opportunity to defend himself and he was convicted. And I think the people who are so quick to say cancel culture is a great thing, they ignore the fact that cancel culture hasn't existed until recently. And yet we've always had mechanisms in place to hold bad people to account. And I think people make a big mistake when they conflate accountability and due process with cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Cancel culture is the lack of due process. It's actually the, the complete opposite side of the coin. In a jury situation, in a trial, you're actually requiring people to come with an open mind, having not made up their minds, and then hear evidence presented. Fair opportunity also for people to defend themselves. Whereas when a Twitter mob, a group of what I call cancel vultures, tries to pick somebody apart and destroy them, they're coming with prejudice. They're drawing conclusions based on usually not knowing anything or having misinformation. They're not coming with an open mind. The person who's under fire has no due process. So the Twitter mob becomes judge, jury, and executioner 
before there's even been a trial. Well, the other point that you just made there that I think is important is that there is a there is a point to our system, which is that at the end of it, you have the expression used so often, well, they served their time. They they paid their obligation, their debt to society. You know, they made good the, for the money that they stole or for the lives that they hurt. And now we have to treat them as being people who, you know, came out at the end of that system. And while we may resent what they originally did, we should not treat them as being people who are no longer – you know, allowed in the public square or treated as if they can, uh, you know, walk the streets without getting yelled at. The flip side is in cancel culture, there is no period where you've served your time. There is only that constant cancellation of saying, well, this person is continuing to show up, you know, again and again. And I don't know, you you may not have read it, um, but uh, there was an, a lengthy piece uh, about Stephen Glass, the infamous, you know, fabulous, uh, the reporter who obviously worked at the New Republic and, you know, was found out by uh, people for having, you know, invented all of these stories and the way that he has navigated his life uh, in recent years, including this uh, relationship that he had uh, with a woman who uh, uh, unfortunately uh, suffered from uh, dementia and, and passed away. And this story was, was uh, uh, reported out uh, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than that. And uh, it's it's very sad story, but it's clearly someone who is trying, you know, in his own way to find some kind of redemptive arc, to find some kind mm-hmm. of way to get out of the fact that, yeah, I did these horrible things and I did them, you know, 20 years ago or however long it was ago. And I would like to find a way to make sure that that is not what I'm remembered for. I want to find a way to, you know, contribute to society or help people or not just be, you know, this having been, uh, been the definitional point uh, of my life, how can we change the way that cancel culture exists within the American concept to make it be something that works better? In other words, that has some element of adjudication or uh, some element of forgiveness and grace Without just the endless kind of punishment, we just want to eradicate you. You know, we want to be the executioner of you. Um, Or is that impossible? No, I believe it's possible. And honestly, that's why I wrote the book. You know, in my day job, I'm not not an author by training. I'm not an author, someone who makes my living as an author, hawking books. I wrote this book because in my day job, I work in communications and crisis management. And I saw firsthand over the last couple of years, all these people who didn't set out to necessarily do anything wrong. Some of them made mistakes for which they wanted to atone. Some of them did absolutely nothing, but they were accused of things. And they lost everything as a consequence. They lost their livelihood. They're no longer employable. They lost their friends. They lost their family. In some cases, they nearly lost their lives, literally. Armed people showed up to take vengeance upon them based upon a lie. And so after seeing this, you know, that's why I felt compelled to write the book, because I don't want that world that we're living in right now, where it's a rush to judgment, where any and all mistakes result in permanent punishment, permanent pariah status for anyone. That's not a world that I want my kids to grow up in. And I think we are better than that in this country. We've always believed that people have a chance to learn and to grow. And, you know, in the book, I look at the five great religions of the world. And I spoke with people from, from who are leaders in each of those religions. And, you know, not only is cancel culture, this idea that you can find something to hate about someone and then hang it around their neck and punish them. Not only is it fundamentally un-American for all the reasons we were talking about, lack of due process, people have a right to freedom of speech and expression, but it's also fundamentally antithetical to the great religions of the world where we learn time and again, you know, you you can refer to scripture, you can look at at the writings um, that are revered by Hindus, by Buddhists, the the lives of of those who, who we look to as religious leaders, and people have a chance at redemption. God is the ultimate judge. People can redeem themselves. 
And I, I think we've lost sight of that. And, you know, it's funny, I was in a discussion with a rabbi about a week ago. And, you know, he and I were debating because he was talking about, oh, isn't there also value in holding people to account? And I said, yes, but what you have to understand is even by, by the cancel culture standards, Moses, who was the greatest, you know, Jews re- re- deemed to be the greatest of the prophets, he would have been canceled mm-hmm. multiple times. I mean, this is a guy who, who took the Ten Commandments and he threw them on the ground. <laughs> Moses killed somebody. Mm-hmm. So Moses would have been canceled for a variety of different reasons. And if, if Moses can be canceled, well, I think we mere mortals could also be canceled. And it, it's, it's just not, it doesn't make any sense. And we're going back this, this picking apart historical figures and looking for reasons to hate them and to demonize them and minimize their contributions to society. And it's not just the Roman Polanskis of the world, but you know, people trying to do this with, you know, George Washington, for instance, mm-hmm. or trying to rewrite books by authors decades after the fact, we, we've really lost the plot, if you will. And it's time to, to bring back some measure of sanity. And I do believe it is possible. I think if people understand better the human cost of this kind of behavior, then they'll be maybe not so quick to judge and to demonize their neighbors, but then also maybe they'll think twice before they take part in an internet pile on of someone else. And maybe they'll, they'll pause and they'll say, you know what? Maybe we don't have all the facts here. Maybe we should reserve judgment and wait to see before we decide that this person deserves the worst possible punishment. Uh, oh no, my other cheek. <laughs> no, the, 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 uh, so the, uh, another question that I have for you, uh, coming out of this, of course, is about cancel culture that works backward and works backward over time in uh, very aggressive ways. We saw the, you know, move in California to, you know, uh, eliminate John Wayne from the uh, name of an airport. We see, you know, the, uh, bringing down of a lot of different people who, uh, while perhaps viewed through modern lenses as being uh, racist or bigoted, were in their time not viewed as such. In fact, you know, were you know, in some ways, you know, uh, progressive. I mean, one one example I would just give is uh, just because I think it's a rather convenient one is you know, without Frank Sinatra, Las Vegas never would have had integration. You know, he insisted upon the ability of black artists to be able to perform in Las Vegas casinos. Uh, where they had not previously been allowed to stay. And he used his power as an entertainer to force that upon Las Vegas. But of course, if you go down the list of things that Frank Sinatra thought about the world, you know, it's going to be pretty offensive to people who are, you know, uh, uh, listening to him a hundred years after uh, he started singing. And so it's one of these things where it's like, you, you have to understand that in context. Unfortunately, today, you know, we are using that not just in an ap- application to people who, you know, were active in the 20th century, but we're using it in terms of people who were active in the 19th and the 18th and the 17th and so on and so forth. How can we prevent the kind of, of iconoclasm that leads to the taking down, the cancellation of people who've been dead for 300 years, but still accomplished amazing things? for the human race and, uh, and for all people, uh, and moved in many ways that the world forward, um, in, uh, in, in ways that, you know, frankly have a direct line to the capability of, of us to see people of all ethnicities raised up today. I am not just optimistic in the, in the form of being Pollyanna ish and thinking, you know, this is a pipe dream that we can get there. I'm actually seeing for the first time, and I've been observing this quite closely, some really good shoots of progress. And and I'm seeing signs, actually, that America is waking up to the danger of this problem. And you have people who are out there on both sides of the political spectrum speaking out against cancel culture and decrying it as a practice. And I think there have actually been some very articulate people, especially on the left. You know, I think of Bill Maher as, as a great example mm-hmm. where, you know, he's someone who's who's unapologetic about his progressive liberal stances on most things. And he's been one of the biggest, most influential people decrying this idea of, of can't, that cancel culture is an acceptable way to take out. I think this is a country that's founded on a marketplace of ideas. We have to be able to debate those ideas and let the best ideas win. I think a lot of people who have been 
who could have been simply victims of cancel culture, they've refused to be canceled and they haven't gone away. And that's one of the fundamental things that I write about. What's the key to not being canceled? It's refusing to be canceled. And so if you don't kowtow to the mob and if you're willing to stand up for yourself and you're willing to push back against the haters, the critics, you find that, that there are opportunities to not just preserve your standing, but even in some cases to go on to bigger and better things. You know, Barry Weiss pushed out of the New York Times. Well, guess what? Barry Weiss is infinitely more influential now that she's out of the New York Times and unchained and can report on what she wants and get involved with you know, things like the University of Austin. Mm. Other academic institutions are really kind of swinging, they're, they're trying to swing the pendulum back the other way. And they're really championing free thought, free expression, trying to turn our universities and schools back into places that are not just kinds of ideology, but actually challenge the students to see things from different perspectives. So I think there are people who are out there by refusing to be canceled, they're pressing forward. You know, Professor Peter Bogosian is another example you know, I don't know about you, but I'd never heard of Portland State University until I heard about them. Mm -hmm. His platform now, he influences the thinking of a lot more people than when he was simply a professor there. So I, I do think there are instances. I think there is a movement. I think people have realized we've gone too far. We've got to stop this. All you, you know, the, the comics, the comedians, we kind of started the discussion by talking about bad jokes. I think Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, Roseanne, from the opposite end of the ideological perspective, they've all been subjected to attempts to take them out, to silence them by the cancel vultures. And they've simply said, no, I'm not going away. I'm not going to be canceled. And I think the average citizen who doesn't necessarily have the same platform, the same resources, the teams of advisors, the money that some celebrities do, we should all be paying attention to that and learning from them so that if and when we get into a situation where people are trying to take us down, you have to be willing to defend yourself. And there is life after cancellation. So that's my final question, which you've anticipated. Uh, okay. For those who cannot afford your uh, wonderful crisis management services, um, what, are, what, are, what are you know three pieces of advice uh, that you would give them when they're tweet is going viral and their you know their instagram post is going everywhere they've had something that's put out there that they fear is going to leave them you know jobless destitute you know unemployable uh, what are your pieces of advice that they should keep top of mind yeah. great question first thing that all your listeners should do is avoid getting canceled in the first place and the best way to do that is before you post anything online follow these two rules, share with care and post with purpose. So before you put that tweet out there, before you go on Facebook on a rant, before you, you know, freestyle with your video going and post it to TikTok or Instagram, whatever you're doing, think about how that's going to be perceived writ large. And is that something that you really feel represents you and how you want people to think of you? And is there a strategic goal that you're somehow accomplishing by putting this content out there. And if, if the answer is no, or you're not really sure, then don't put it out there. Because if it doesn't advance and it doesn't advance the, the conversation that way, or it's a negative or it's a, an attack on someone else, simply choosing not to do it is the best way to avoid getting yourself into hot water. The other is, like I said before, you've got to be able to advocate for yourself. And so in the instance that you do find yourself under fire, you cannot afford to just sit back and wait and hope for the storm to pass because by the time that happens, it may be too late. So if someone is putting out misinformation, if they've got the story wrong, you owe it to yourself to get in the fight. So when the reporter calls, don't duck the call, don't no comment them, actually avail yourself of the opportunity to put your message out there or create your own content that shines a light on the facts and presses the truth and counters the information that's out there. And third, even if people can't necessarily afford our services, although I suspect a lot of people can, those who can't can certainly afford the price of picking up a, can a, pick a copy of the Cancel Culture Curse because it does have an entire playbook 
that I lay out in there, yes. which is loads of steps that people can take to try to empower themselves. And, you know, some people have come at me since I wrote this book and they said, oh, this is this is a grift. This is, you know, why are you doing this? Well, actually, the inverse is true. I'm in high stakes and crisis PR. So, it'll you know, cancel culture has actually been quite good to my business. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of clients who've been under fire. So the thing is, though, I think it's fundamentally un-American. I think it's bad for our society. So I actually hope that this book puts our cancel culture side of our business out of business. I don't want to have to help people fight and claw to maintain their livelihood and to restore their reputations mm. when people have taken them down over complete nonsense. And so, you know, keep faith, I would say to everyone, avoid a, avoiding trouble in the first place. An ounce of, of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But then if in fact you do find yourself in hot water, you got to be willing to get in the fight. And in this day and age, you can't simply sit back and hope someone else is going to advocate for you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Evan, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Yeah, it was great. Great conversation. Thanks for having me, Ben.